Uh, my name is uh, Alice Orniotti. I'm a security researcher in, at IBM Research and today I'll present some joint work with EPFL and Northeastern University on speculative execution attacks. Um, before I give you an outline of the talk, uh, let's introduce first the main character of the presentation, which is speculative execution attacks. Uh, the starting point uh, for these family of attacks is uh, when the CPU pipeline encounters a branch instruction for which the target is not immediately known. Uh, at this point, the, the pipeline has two options. It could either wait for the target to become known uh, but that would be bad from a performance standpoint because it would have to store the pipeline. So what happens instead is that the CPU makes an educated guess on, on the target, uh, and this guess is aided by a set of microarchitectural uh, predictor units. Um, so basically execution restarts immediately at the predicted target, uh, and any side effect from the speculated instructions uh, become visible. So for instance, in yellow, you have the side effects uh, caused by uh, load instructions. Um, more interestingly still is the case of what happens when the prediction turns out to be wrong. Um, so in this case, the CPU has to undo all the side effects of uh, all of the instructions that have to be rolled back. And uh, from a programming perspective, uh, per, from a program correctness perspective, this rollback is perfect. Um, otherwise, you'd have a CPU bug. Uh, but uh, from a microarchitectural standpoint, however, um, there are certain traces that the CPU does not erase. For instance, uh, the data that was brought in the cache uh, will remain in the cache after the rollback. The CPU does not go ahead and, and undo that. So the central point of speculative execution attacks is that uh, if the cached information uh, brought in as part of transient execution is uh, some secret of a victim process, uh, an attacker has the chance later to, uh, to extract it and, and read this secret. So with this in mind, uh, we can take a look at the breakdown of uh, most uh, speculative execution attacks. Uh, there's a first phase uh, during which the attacker trains the victim. The training has the purpose of maximizing the success rate and ensuring that uh, the victim leaks interesting data, so secrets uh, and, and the likes. Uh, and in the second phase, uh, the attacker causes the victim to, uh, the, the, the control flow of the victim to be hijacked uh, speculatively to an interesting location. Interesting location, it has to, some, something interesting for the attacker must take place. And in particular, typically you ha you'll have uh, the send operation of a side channel that extracts data from the victim and sends it to the attacker so that in step four later the attacker can execute the, the receive end uh, of the side channel to retrieve this, uh, this secret data. So uh, now that we have introduced the, the main character, I can walk you through, the, through our results. Uh, this presentation, in fact, uh, due to time constraints, is going to be just a teaser of uh, the papers that uh, I, I referenced below. So if you're interested, go ahead and, and check them out. Uh, so at first, we'll discuss some methodology and tooling. Um, it might so sound boring, but it's actually a, a very interesting question. How uh, can we find out exactly what the CPU is doing while speculating, when by definition the CPU will undo most of the things whenever it, it has to roll back. Um, we come up with a new methodology and tooling and method and tool uh, that we describe are instrumental for the subsequent findings. Uh, at first, in particular, we describe uh, new speculative execution triggers, that is new ways in which an attacker can influence the speculative control flow of a victim process uh, and get it to speculate interest, interesting uh, gadget, inter, interesting uh, sequences of instructions. And finally, we present uh, new side channels, uh, that is new ways in which the attacker can extract interesting information from, from the victim. Um, so good, let's, uh, let's start with the methodology and tooling. Um, 
the question here is how can we study this type of attacks? Um, take the case of memory corruption, bugs, and uh, related vulnerabilities. Uh, there's really a ton of tools. Uh, like PickGDB, you feed it with a crash that is related to memory corruption, uh, and then you take it from there. You figure out what's going on, if you can exploit it, and so forth. Uh, unsurprisingly, there is no such thing for speculative execution attacks. There's no GDB. In fact, there's not even an efficient way to observe what the CPU does since all you're supposed to see at the architectural level, by definition, is what the programmer wrote in the, in the code source. Um, so one obvious way to observe this would be uh, mount the full attack uh, and then use the, the side channel that I described earlier to see whether the attack was successful or not, how often and it's successful and so forth. Uh, this of course leads correct results, but it's very slow and it's very noisy. Um, so it's great from an attack perspective because it works, but it's not great to develop uh, the attack. And so what we propose is slightly different, is to use performance counters. Um, performance counters are available on mo most modern CPUs uh, to count or to get timing information uh, for certain uh, microarchitectural events. And they, they're designed and available for developers to uh, profile and optimize uh, any code snippet that executes. And we, what we found out is that if, if used correctly, or rather I should say misused correctly because they're designed for something else, uh, they actually represent a great way, a much faster and noise-free way of uh, detecting a speculative execution. Um, the way in which we do this is by using what we call speculative execution markers. So a speculative execution marker is an instruction or a sequence of instruction that is detectable by performance counters even when uh, the instruction does not retire. So here's the, the central idea. Uh, we can introduce these markers in a snippet that we want to analyze and by uh, so we execute the snippet with the appropriate markers inserted and then we read performance counters after execution and we can tell things like uh, which target was speculated, um, how deep did speculation reach before it was uh, stopped, uh, how often a branch instruction was mispredicted and uh, how efficient a training phase was and, and so on and so forth. So very powerful and useful information. Um, so around this methodology, we've built a tool which we call Speculator. Uh, we've released it on uh, in open source. It's on GitHub. Go ahead, check it out. Uh, there's plenty of documentation, so I, I won't go too much into the detail. But the big picture is that you supply it with a, a piece of uh, assembly or C code, and uh, and the tool will basically uh, add the necessary instrumentation and uh, execute it uh, however many times it's necessary and then produce results that give all this information uh, back to the, to the developer. Um, good, now let's put Speculator to good use. Um, at first I'll show you new speculative execution triggers. That is basically new ways in which an attacker can influence the speculative control flow uh, to get the victim to execute interesting, uh, interesting gadgets. Uh, so traditionally, uh, the speculative control flow is hijacked uh, by an attacker when the attacker meddles with some microarchitectural components. These predictors that I mentioned earlier. For example, the attacker can hijack uh, a backward edge, so a return, by tampering with the return stack buffer. Uh, the, the, that's what takes place in Spectre RSB or it can hijack a forward edge by tampering with uh, BTB. That's what takes place in, in uh, Spectre V2. Uh, the new class of triggers that we, uh, that we present instead is leveraging overwrites of uh, metadata that influences the control flow in an architectural level. So I'm talking about uh, metadata such as uh, the return address that is saved on the stack for backward edges or a function pointer uh, for, a, for a forward edge. 
Uh, and such metadata can be overwritten uh, both architecturally and speculatively, and this uh, creates basically four variants that, uh, that we describe. Uh, so let's look at some examples. Um, the case of uh, architectural overwrites of a banquet edge happens uh, when you have a classic buffer overflow and you have a program that is compiled with uh, uh, stack smashing protection. So uh, by definition, the crash will not, the, the buffer overflow will not be um, exploitable uh, in the classical uh, memory safety sense. Uh, however, speculatively, let's, let's see what, what happens. Um, basically, you can see the SSP epilogue uh, from LLVM in the, in the slide. Uh, there's basically a conditional branch that will lead the program to uh, an orderly crash uh, if uh, an overflow took place and was detected, or just otherwise the, the classic return. Uh, speculatively, however, the conditional branch will be trained to assume that no overflow uh, takes place if, uh, if you, the, the application has been executed already a few times. And so whenever there is one, uh, again, speculatively, the victim will bypass uh, the SSP protection and it will just resume execution uh, at the uh, malicious return address. And if there's a gadget there, uh, the attacker has, has a chance to extract interesting data. Um, let's look at, uh, at another case. Uh, here we have a speculative overwrite of a forward edge. And uh, the example that we, uh, we looked into is, uh, is this snippet of uh, Go code um, consisting of a store into an array followed uh, by closely by an interface call. So Go, as we know, is a, is a memory safe language. And so it will introduce a bounds check on that array operation. Um, however, even in presence of uh, an out of bounds uh, index, uh, the bounds check can be trained to be speculatively bypassed, basically to assume that the uh, bound, uh, that the index is in bounds. Uh, and this way, the out of bounds store will take place speculatively. And so what the attacker gets here is a write what where uh, primitive, uh, that, we're, that can be used to transiently overwrite, uh, for instance, in this case, the function pointer uh, for the following interface call. And then again, you have, uh, you have this speculative control flow hijack. Um, now, we have a few ways in which uh, the attacker can control uh, the speculative execution. Uh, let's see what we can do with this. Let's see how we can uh, use this to actually leak some secrets. Uh, so traditionally, Spectre and related uh, vulnerabilities adopt, uh, use a gadget like the one in the, in the slide, so basically a double array dereference. Uh, whenever this is executed speculatively, if the attacker controls X, uh, and X could be out of bounds, um, uh, the ga this gadget will leak in the cache uh, under certain assumptions, uh, some bits about array one of X. Um, this is great, but the problem with this gadget is that it turns out it's relatively infrequent in programs. In fact, in most POCs in the literature, it's assumed that the attacker can inject it, uh, can inject this or a similar, um, a similar gadget, either through uh, eBPF or JavaScript or whatnot. So, we investigated a very different side channel here, one that is based on port contention. So let me introduce uh, the, the concept first. So execution ports are used to, by the CPU to schedule instructions to execution units. Um, different instructions use uh, specific ports. For instance, uh, here you have shift left using port zero and pop count using port one. Uh, here's the idea. Uh, the attacker takes timing measurements uh, when it executes pop count instructions in a, in a tight loop. Um, and the idea is that if uh, the timing measurements are slow, uh, based on some profiling 
uh, that the attacker can uh, can perform beforehand. If execution is slow, it means that the attacker is picking up on uh, port contention caused by a co-located victim, that is, say, also executing pop counts. Uh, otherwise, if execution is fast, it means that the victim is, is executing something else. So, for instance, shift left on a different port. Uh, so, the, that, that is our side channel through which we can leak uh, information from a victim, and we call this side channel uh, smother. Uh, from you know, SMT, the, the Intel's hyper-threading um, technology. So how can we use Smother in the context of speculative execution attacks as a uh, Spectre side channel? Uh, the solution is, is uh, relatively simple. So the idea is we find in the victim, uh, in the victim code, a conditional branch uh, that depends on a secret. And the target and the fall through of this conditional branch should have and should generate measurably different contention on some execution port. So again, in the uh, port zero, port one example uh, that we have uh, before, you, you can either time a contention for both uh, victim and attacker executing pop counts or uh, no contention and so fast timing on the attacker side if one is executing shift left and the other uh, pop count. Um, so this is the full uh, smother specter side channel in operation. You have a victim um, that has a secret. Um, the speculative At first the speculative control flow needs to be hijacked using whichever way um, in the literature uh, is, is, uh, is suitable here. Um, this hijack leads the victim to execute uh, the conditional branch that I discussed uh, before, depending on the secret. Uh, and based on the secret, different port contention is generated. And the attacker on its side, it's uh, just in a loop gathering timing uh, information. Uh, as we discussed before, the timing leads to uh, two nicely disjoint probability distributions of how long it takes uh, for the timing sequence to be executed. Say, if the secret is one, it takes longer than if the secret is uh, it's zero. And the information from the distribution can be used to determine a timing threshold from which we can finally extract the value of the secret. So, for instance, uh, if we get uh, a timing of 101 uh, clock cycles, we can uh, assume that the secret was 1. If we get 82, we can assume that the secret was 0, and so on and so forth. Um, and so that is how we extract uh, secrets from the uh, victim. Uh, thanks very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>